Hello everybody, welcome back to the Tin Man's Corner channel. I'm your host Jeffrey Tin Man Taylor and today I'm reading another chapter out of my Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde book. And chapter 6 is called Remarkable Incident of Dr. Lanyon. Time ran on. Thousands of pounds were offered in reward for the death of Sir Danvers. Was resented as a public injury. But Mr. Hyde had disappeared out of the ken of the police as thought he had never existed. Much of his past was unearthed indeed, and all disreputable tales came out of the man's cruelty at once so callous and violent of his vile life, of his strange associates, of the hatred that seemed to have surrounded his career, but of his pre present whereabouts, not a whisper. From the time he had left the house in Soho on the morning of the murder, he was simply blotted out, and gradually, as time drew on, Mr. Utterson began to recover from the hotness of his alarm, and to grow more at quiet with himself, the death of Sir Danvers was to his way of thinking more than paid for by the disappearance of Mr. Hyde. Now that that evil influence had been withdrawn, a new life began for Dr. Jekyll. He came out of his seclusion, renewed relations with his friends, became one more their familiar guest and entertainer, and with he had always been known for charities, he was now no less distinguished for religion. He was busy, he was much in the open air, he did good, his face seemed to open and brighten as if with an inward conscience of service. And for more than two months the doctor was at peace. On the 8th of January, Utterson had uh, dined at the doctor's with a small party. Lanyon had been there, and the face of the host had looked from one to the other, as in the old days when the trio were inseparable friends. On the 12th, and again on the 14th, the door was shut against the lawyer. The doctor was confined to the house, Poole said, and saw no one. On the 15th, he tried again and was again refused. And having now been used for the last two months to see his friend almost daily, he found this return of solitude to weigh upon his spirits. The fifth night he had in guest to dine with him, and the sixth he betook himself to Dr. Lanyon's. So you see Dr. Jekyll right here going out again. There at least he was not denied a minute, but when he came in, he was shocked at the change which had taken place in the doctor's appearance. He had his death warrant written legally upon his face. The rosy man had grown pale. His flesh had fallen away. He was visibly bolder and older. And yet it was not so much these tokens of a swift physical decay that arrested the lawyer's notice as a look in the eye and quality of manner that seemed to testified to some deep-seated terror of the mind. It was unlikely that the doctor should fear death, and yet that was what Utterson was tempted to suspect. Yes, he thought, he is a doctor, he must know his own state, and that his days are counted, and the knowledge is more than he could bear. And yet, when Utterson remarked on his ill looks, it was with an air of great firmness that Lanyon declared himself a doomed man. I have had a shock, he said, and I shall never recover. It is a question of weeks. Well, life has been pleasant. I liked it. Yes, sir. I used to like it. I sometimes think if we knew all, we should be more glad to get away. Jekyll is ill, too, observed Utterson. Have you seen him? But Lanyon's face changed, and he held 
up a trembling hand. I wish you to see or hear no more of Dr. Jekyll. He said in a loud, unsteady voice, I am quite done with that person, and I beg that you will spare me any allusion to one whom I regard as dead. Tut, tut, said Mr. Utterson. And then, after a considerable pause, can I do anything? He inquired. We are three very old friends, Lanyon. We shall not live to make others. Nothing can be done, returned Lanyon, asked himself. He will not see me, said the lawyer. And I am not surprised at that, was the reply. Some day, Utterson, after I am dead, you may perhaps come to learn the right and wrong of this. I cannot tell you, and in the meantime, if you can sit and talk with me of other things, for God's sake, stay and do so. But if you cannot keep clear of this accursed topic, then in God's name go, for I cannot bear it. As soon as he got home, Utterson sat down and wrote to Jekyll, complaining of his exclusion from the house and asking the cause of this unhappy break with Lanyon, and the next day brought him a long answer, often very pathetically worded and sometimes darkly mysterious in drift. The quarrel with Lanyon was incurable. I don't, or I do not blame our old friend Jekyll, wrote, but I share his view that we must never meet, I mean from henceforth to lead a life of extreme seclusion. You must not be surprised, nor must you doubt my friendship. If my door is often shut even to you, you must suffer me to go my own dark way. I have brought out myself a punishment and a danger that I cannot name. If I am the chief of sinners, I am the chief of sufferers also. I could not think that this earth contained a place for sufferings and terrors so unmanning. And you can do but one thing, Utterson, to lighten this destiny, and that is to respect my silence. Utterson was amazed. The dark influence of Hyde had been withdrawn. The doctor had returned to his old task and amenities a week ago. The prospect had smiled with every promise of a cheerful and honor age, and now in a moment friendship and peace of mind, the whole tenor of his life were wrecked, so great and unprepared a change pointed to madness, but in view of Lanyon's manner and words, there must lie for it some deeper ground. A week afterwards, Dr. Lanyon took to his bed, and in something less than a fortnight, he was dead. The night after the funeral at which he had been sadly affected, Utterson locked the door of his business room and sitting there by the light of a melancholy candle, drew out and set before him an envelope addressed by the hand and sealed with the seal of his dead friend, private for the hands of G. J. Utterson alone, and in case of his predeceased to be destroyed unread. So it was emphatically, sir, prescribed, and the lawyer dreaded to behold the contents. I have buried one friend today, he thought. What if this should cost me another? And then he condemned the fear as a disloyalty and broke the seal. Within there was another enclosure, likewise sealed and marked upon the cover as not to be opened till the death or disappearance of Dr. Henry Jekyll. Utterson could not trust his eyes. Yes, it was disappearance here again, as in the mad will which he had long ago restored to its author. Here again, where the idea of a disappearance in the name of Henry Jekyll bracketed. But in the will, that idea had sprung from the sinister digestion of the man Hyde. It was set there with a purpose all too plain and horrible. Written by the hand of Lanyon, what should it mean? A great curiosity came on the trustee to disregard the prohibition and dive at once to the bottom of these mysteries. But professional honor and faith to his dead friend 
were stricken obligations, and the packet slept in the inmost corner of his private safe. It is one thing to mortify curiosity, another to conquer it, and it may be doubted if from the day forth Utterson desired the society of his surviving friend. With the same eagerness, he thought of him kindly, but his thoughts were disquieted and fearful. He went to call in deed, but he was perhaps relieved to be denied immenses, perhaps. In his heart, he preferred to speak with Poole upon the doorstep and surrounded by the air and sounds of the open city, rather than to be admitted into that house of voluntary bondage and to sit and speak with its inscrutable recluse. Poole had indeed no very pleasant news to communicate. The doctor, it appeared, now more than ever, confined himself to the cabinet over the laboratory, where he would sometimes even sleep. He was out of spirits. He had grown very silent. He did not read. It seemed as if he had something on his mind. Utterson became so used to the unvaried character of these reports that he fell off little by little in the frequency of his visits. All right, that's chapter six of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde done and dusted. And I'm thinking, you know, Mr. Hyde has probably given Jekyll a break from him turning back into Hyde and everything. But it's probably not going to last long. And Dr. Jekyll's just like trying to figure out a cure quick. Hopefully. But I won't know until we continue reading on in this book. So I hope you guys enjoyed this chapter. And don't forget to like, subscribe, turn on those post notifications for more book reading content like this. This has been another successful installment of the Tin Man's Corner channel. I'm your host, Jeffrey Tin Man Taylor, and I say that's a wrap and have a nice day, buddy.